Russ Irwin, thank you so much for joining me from Los Angeles today. Mm -hmm. um, really grateful for your time. You are a massively illustrious musician, producer. You have worked with a host of household names in music. You've worked with uh, Aerosmith. You've worked with Sting. You've worked with Brian Adams, Meatloaf, Foreigner. I'm reliving my youth at the moment. Cheap Trick, Joe Bonamassa, Kurt Smith. You've got your own collection of recordings. How did you get into this lifestyle? How did I get into this lifestyle? Um, I started playing when I was very young. Uh, I was probably seven years old. I started playing music. Um, I had an older brother who was very into music who got me into playing the drums. We were both drummers. And uh, I um, played drums for a year or two and then went to piano and started really playing songs. I was really just into pop songs and pop and rock music, which was really um, during the 70s. You know, music, I think, was at its height of um, 60s, 70s and 80s. Music was really um, an important part of our, our, our culture and what was happening in the world. And uh, so it was just very important to me at a very young age. And I took it very seriously. And I... So I went from drums to guitar to singing, to piano, actually. Drums, piano, guitar, and singing, all before the age of 12. So I started when I was seven. By the time I was 12, I was playing all those instruments. And then as I developed, I started becoming a songwriter and eventually went to college, went originally to NYU to go to the music business program. And... Uh, and also studied classical piano with a professor named Ron Sadoff, who is now one of the heads of the music department at NYU, who was a classical piano player from Juilliard. And he uh, kind of became my main inspiration for getting into classical music. And I think the reasoning behind me wanting to get into classical and jazz w was to become a better songwriter because a lot of the songwriters that I really looked up to they understood a lot of different styles of music and I always thought that that would made for a really interesting songwriting and obviously the best example of that is is Paul McCartney <clears throat> you know uh you know you listen to the diverse range of what he's able to write um and people like Sting um and and Prince was another big influence, you know, someone who, you know, if you listen to him and how deep his roots are with so many different styles, it's incredible. So anyway, I had a lot of uh, inspiration from a lot of different people and I, and I never really lost focus. And that's kind of, uh, that's really just been the thread through my entire career. So there was never any question that you were going to do anything but music from age seven onwards there were no other options for you but i mean no, no, no that's not true either is that right <laughs> no 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 that's definitely not true i've had so many ups and downs yeah um as a matter of fact i i quit music actually at one point so um i uh yeah i when i moved to manhattan to go to nyu i um i started working professionally immediately i i actually was very lucky. I got a mentor. This guy, his name's Greg Garrison. He's a great musician. He's a drummer and a flute player. And he got me on all these many, many different gigs. And I had my own bands. And I was so I was working very hard while I was also studying and going to college. <clears throat> but I got a record deal when I was uh, just started my third year in college. I got a record deal with a solo artist. And I did that for about five years. We put out one record. We had two songs that uh, charted, one on the pop charts, one on the rock charts. And then one day, I was literally, I think we had just played The Tonight Show and the song, the, one of the songs was just about to go top 20. And one of the heads of the label came and came to my gig and said, we just got bought by EMI and your record's over. <laughs> I was 23. 
Right. Well, I and never after, had a disappointment. So yeah, and I kind of left. I didn't leave college completely. Like I went part time after I got offered the record deal, but um, but I spent about five years on that whole deal. By the time I was twenty five, it, it finally ended, and uh, I was very disappointed. So I actually did quit music, and um, I had a couple of odd jobs for a while. I I was a bartender for a while, and then I went to work on Wall Street for a year. I went back to NYU. But people kept asking me to play in their bands. And then people kept ask, started asking me to, to do commercials. So I started doing commercials um, full time almost. When I say doing commercials, I was writing the music and producing the music for commercials. And I did that for years. And I, I did it for like 20 years. But um, I was doing it full time for a few years and I was really just doing it for the money um, with, you know, the idea that I was not going to play music anymore. Um, <clears throat> I was that disappointed, you know, and, uh, but the craft of film scoring and producing music for television it was very, it was very exciting because um, I had no emotional attachment to it. Mm -hmm. um, plus, they, you know, there was a lot of work, so I was able to work every day, and have people be like, "You're going to get paid three grand for this, five grand for that, or twenty grand for that," and all of a sudden, I was making money as a film composer, as as you know, doing commercials and some TV here and there, and that kind of kept me kept my foot in the door with music, but I really wasn't planning on continuing to play music. Um, and uh, so I was really kind of just doing it from the morning, not realizing that I was actually developing this craft in film scoring, which became very useful. Um, and then I also got asked to play with Kurt Smith from Tears for Fears, the lead, one of the lead singers in his band. And that kind of made me, you know, you took pause and thought, okay, maybe this is this is a sign. Uh, yeah, no, it was it was a great experience. You know, it was like all of a sudden I was playing with a lot of an amazing um, a listers in a band that a lot of people were going to see. Um, but I didn't know, I you know, I didn't know if it was really going to lead to anything. Um, it wasn't like I was making that much money doing it. Um, but I loved the music. I loved the guys in the band. But uh, when I was, so I got signed when I was 20. That went on for about five years. And then another four or five years went by with film score, doing commercials and playing with Kurt. And I, I, I thought that by the time I was 30, that if I wasn't really making a good living, that I was going to do something else. Um, and then on like right before my 29th birthday, I got, I got the Aerosmith gig. And that changed everything because um, all of a sudden it was just like everything just opened up. I just started getting calls from people to play with all different types of bands. And then once I was working with all these different types of bands, people saw that I could write. They saw that I could produce. Um, they saw that I could do film scoring and that I could play um, you know, multiple instruments. So it, it became very useful for a lot of people. And, okay. uh, and that, then that led to basically everything else that happened after that. You know? well, okay. So having trained in classical music and then how did you get the gig with Aerosmith? Was it just personal contacts or had they seen you perform with Tears for Fear? Like, what was the, the, the moment <laughs> there? Because there's a, there's a massive spectrum between learning classical music and playing with Aerosmith. I think we can agree. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, they're totally different um, areas, obviously. But but music is music, you know. Music is math, really, you know. Um, so to me, uh, the the craft of music is is always the same, regardless of the style. Um, so I don't. I actually don't really approach music when I, if it's, if it's classical, yeah, you have to kind of stick to the page, but you, you do have to stick to the page. But 
I don't know. I, to me, it's just all music. It's it's all one. Um, to me, it's all just a learning experience, and it, you know, you bring all these different um, techniques together, you know. And uh, so, yeah, that's you know, kind of how it happens. Yeah. So, but most of the well, but the, I guess the music that you've played in the past has been really technically challenging. Uh, the premise of the Badass podcast is about reinventing oneself, and you've clearly done that on multiple occasions. And what I love best about you, Russ, is that you are so anti-badass that it is, in fact, badass. Because, you know, you'd expect that having played with heavy metal and all these going on tours and, you know, the lifestyle associated or how most of us associate a lifestyle of a touring band, um, but you're approach to life you are vegan you you don't drink you don't smoke you work out you look after yourself really really well um, I try my best you do your best well I mean you're very well preserved and I think it's amazing that you have sort of gone through all of that unscathed um so you clearly I don't know have... if I would say that though <laughs> <laughs> By all by all appearances, anyway. But um, I think it's amazing that it's in stark contrast of what one would expect from that lifestyle, and and your humility as well. I think both of those things going working together are amazing because that just it just um, shows that you 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 approach life in a very um, a healthy kind of way. I try to, and maybe on the you know from. From an outsider's point of view, maybe it, it seems like I'm very good, you know, good at it. But it's really been a roller coaster ride, and it's always, always been challenging. Music has never, you know, it's had so many ups and downs. And I think part of the reason why I'm, uh, I might have some humility is because I've been very successful, and um, and I've failed a lot as well. So I've I've been, you know, high highs, low lows, back to high highs, back to low lows. It's been up and down. So I've kind of been around the block a few times, you know, and um, I ha I do notice that like with people who just, you know, shoot straight to the top, top and stay there, they have a totally different sort of um attitude or vibe about you know their success maybe they feel like they really earned it or deserved it and then that's it you know for them but i i've been up and down so <clears throat> it's been different for me you know and i find I, a lot of the artists that i've worked with who are older like aerosmith is a really perfect example um they've been up and down you know they they had a huge career in the 70s they completely bottomed out in the 80s they became broke they became drug addicts and then they um, they sobered up and they, you know, came back, you know, they ever and uh, bigger than ever. Mm -hmm. But I've also watched them, you know, I was with them for 17 years and then I, I watched them go up and down. You know, um, I watched uh, their lives all change, you know, and anyone can just kind of look at you know, the outside of it and be like, oh, their life must be so great or, you know, like, you know, because they're rich and like, you know, they, their success didn't stop really, you know, from like 1987 through today, you know, but when you're on the inside, it's different. Everybody's got their ups and downs. And, um, and, and, you know, with, I watched, you know, not just my own life, but with those five guys, you know, one guy is, you know, doing this and the other guy's doing that. And it's like, so it's just, a, you know, a constant ups and downs for everybody. You, you know? feel that, that uh, you've learned more from, you know, having those ups and downs or I mean, where, where is the uh, the life lesson and all of that? I kind, of, I kind of feel like, you know, the the success thing is, is really a combination of preparation, meeting opportunity and luck, mm -hmm. you know? I could have not gotten that phone call, you know, the first one, I mean, for any of them, you know, it could, they could have uh, called me and like, you know, could have gone to my, you know, to, to my messages, you know what I mean? Like, 
and and that you know and i've had a lot of missed opportunities you know i've had a lot of op- people have called me and i'm like you know i want to do that gig and then it doesn't happen because of scheduling or whatever you know but um i actually think uh i mean i think you have to th- there's a lot of things that that can make up everyone anyone's success but but i think luck is really probably the biggest to be honest with you so in terms of of how you've dealt with uh i suppose reinventing all of these different personas yes i've I've done a lot of different styles and and a lot and probably a lot of different styles that most people would never even know you know because i've done orchestral music as well you know working with orchestras um for film and um so yeah you know I, i think there's there's a lot of my most of my music that i've created most people haven't heard you know I have hundreds and hundreds of songs and hundreds and hundreds of pieces of music in my computer that no one will ever hear. What what, what would you say is uh, the, the piece that you've done that you're most, or the, we're not necessarily the piece of music, but the the part of your life that you are most proud of where, you've, where you reflect, okay, this is the legacy. Um, that's probably my album, Get Me Home, which was my solo record, the fourth one that I made actually. Um, <clears throat> so, and the story behind that is interesting, I think, for me it is anyway. Um, when I was, when I got signed as a solo artist when I was very young and I was in college, I was signed to a uh, um, a very big record deal, a lot of money, a lot of, you know, heavy hitting executives. I was 20 years old, I started working with this producer who, his name was Phil Ramone, who produced all the biggest Billy Joel records, Paul Simon, who produced Paul McCartney, and he was probably 60, I was 20, and, um, you know, I just saw all these executives kind of take over that process, and by the time the record was done, I did not like the record um, at all. I actually asked them not to release it. (laughs) <laughs> and um, they did anyway. Oh. So that was a very big, that was another reason why it was such a big disappointment was because I wasn't really able to make the record that I wanted to make. So years later, when I find, when I started playing with Aerosmith and then staying and all these people and I started making good money, I, I, you know, I spent some money and time to make my own albums the way that I wanted to make them. And the album Get Me Home, which came out in 2012, I think I started making it in 2010. Um, that album, the way that that happened was, uh, it's actually a funny story. I had had my best year ever, I think in 2010. And my accountant called me and said, uh, Russ, you gotta spend some money. It's like, you know, you, you gotta write off some, you go buy some guitars or I was like, I already have, the guitars that I want, blah, blah, blah. So I uh, I decided, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go to a recording studio with this one producer who I really thought was great. And I'm gonna record some music and I'm gonna go there for a week and work with his band. And I'm just gonna have fun. And I'm just gonna, and I'm never gonna play this music for anybody. I wanted to get back to why I started playing music when I was a teenager not for money, not as a career, just because the pure love of it. I think I had seen a documentary um, on the making of Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, Elton John, and the way that they made that record, which was basically uh, the whole band lived in a house. Bernie Taupin was there, his um, lyricist. And they would, you know, Bernie would wake up, he'd write the lyric, give it to Elton, Elton would write the song, and in the afternoon, the band would record it. And that's basically what we did for a week. And um, it was so fun (laughs) that I decided to do it again. And I was so into it that I started playing it for people. People were like, this is great, you know, and blah, blah. And I think the first person I played it for was was Steven Tyler. And he was like, I should should sing on that song. And I was like, really? Wow. (laughs) So anyway, he ended up singing on two of the songs. And so, and it, then all of a sudden it became a record and I was like, I realized I was going to actually release it, but it was really an accident to be honest with you. 
but that's the thing I'm most proud of. And it's kind of ironic that like I had no intention of ever playing it for anybody. Mm-hmm. And it's still available at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, it's on Spotify. It should be on. I've listened uh, to it. I think it's amazing. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah. It was done it. completely different than most records. It was done like an old record. It was, we weren't using click tracks. We, um, the band was playing live. We were all playing at the same time. You know, it wasn't the way records are usually made anymore, mm-hmm. you know? So, well, so. that's a good point. I mean, the industry has changed completely. The, the genres changed completely. Everything is a bit over retouched and electronic. And how do you feel you fit into music these days? How do I? Uh, it's, you know, that's the challenge now is that music keeps evolving. And especially with technology, the sound keeps changing with with the technology. It keeps getting more and more intricate and people have more and more um, control programs, algorithms, ways to make music. And I find that a lot of the younger songwriters um, and producers that I work with, they don't even play instruments anymore. They just they just use a computer. So everything's programmed and uh, and, it, and it makes for a very specific sound, which when people do it well, I think it's amazing. You know, I think that, uh, you know, I like, like with any time in music, there's most of it's crap, you know, maybe 20% of it's good and 5% of it's great or something like that, you know? So, you know, there's always a lot of bad music or not, I don't want to say bad, but, you know, just like stuff that, you know, doesn't do anything for you. Do you feel that in spite of all the different technologies available, that the, I suppose, the main focus still is on lyrics and songwriting? Or, I mean, because now anybody can can be um, a singer. They shouldn't necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, the strength that's... of a song really is in its content much more than the delivery perhaps um, maybe being controversial um, you know uh, it, it just keeps shifting to be honest with you you know like I, I don't think um, a, a songwriter in the classic sense the way that people used to write songs years ago that's not really happening that much anymore. I mean, some people do it, but that's not really what's on the forefront of what's um, getting listened to. I think, you know, most people are listening to electronic music, very programmed. Uh, not me. <laughs> Don't look at me. I'm still <laughs> in know, the 80s and 90s, so uh, I can't quite get my head around what's going on these days. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just it, it's just where it, where it is, and it's going to keep evolving, you know, but... I don't particularly see another rock band coming out and like changing the world. Like I saw Nirvana do, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, So, but, you know, I do listen to, uh, I think like right now we're at the end of 2023 and I listen to Dua Lipa. Mm -hmm. And I I think that the production on that record is incredible. Um, But I love tearing uh, music apart. I like uh, listening to it and trying to understand how they got there, you know. And and now there's so much. It's a it's a blessing and a curse, you know. There's like there's so much music out there, and there's it's so much easier for people to create music back when you know, before computers, it was very difficult to create music and to make it, you know, really competitive, and sound great when you know you don't have a recording budget or a record company but now anyone can do it on their laptop so you know there are pros and cons to each you know now i can i can make whatever record i want and i can pretty much do it for free um and anyone can but you is know. there is there really money to be made anymore in the sense in in the same way that there was in the eighties and nineties since you know between Spotify and Apple Music and all these other streaming platforms, um, I think the industry so that's, itself. Has... That's the interesting thing is that you know it's really 
um, it's like uh, it's just expanded exponentially in both directions. Like it's it's you know interesting that you know artists get paid almost nothing you know to get played on Spotify, um, and it's you know to build a following on YouTube is difficult. It takes years, you know. But then on the other hand, the top artists in the world, like for example, Taylor Swift, she's, you know, making billions of dollars. And I saw this interview with, with Nirvana and Kurt Cobain. Somebody said to him, oh, you know, Madonna is, is charging like $175 a ticket. And Kurt said, what? He's like, we, we charge 50, $50. And I was like, my <laughs> God. And I just heard that U2 is playing in Vegas at the Sphere, and they're charging $2,500 a ticket. So it's like, I, I really think that it's, it's, it's feast or famine, and in the most extreme way ever. You know? It's just, it's craziness, you know? There are people make killing it, and they're just, and then... You know, I have a, um, a, an assistant I work with who just got out of Berkeley. He's 23 years old. He told me, he's like, he's like, all the professors, they all tell us we're never going to make a penny at this. And it's much harder work because you've got to do all these tours and keep the, the fueling. It's, with it the is hard machine. work. I, I, think, I think there's a lot of misconception about what, you know, musicians who actually, you know, really sit in front of a screen and, and produce a track and take it from point A to point Z and complete it and put it into the world and it's great, you know, and you can make no money off of it. That process, I find a lot of people are like, oh, you're a musician, that must be like so, like, you know, what do you really do, you know? <laughs> Sit around with your guitar, you know, like they don't understand, it's a, it's a very serious craft. Mm -hmm. For the people who take it that seriously and that deeply. So, but I think the fact that people, still go into the industry knowing there's a very good chance they're never going to make a penny and they're probably going to have to pay for the privilege of being in the industry. Yeah, that's the joke about musicians, you know? It's like, oh, you know, they'll spend, you know, $1,000 on a guitar or $500 on an app and they'll, like, put all this gas in their car to go play a gig for 20 bucks that no yeah. one comes to. But that says a lot <laughs> about their passion and their drive. It says a lot about their passion. And the funny thing is, is that I find that people on the business side, they just call that stupid, you know? They're just like, that's why musicians are stupid because they'll do it for free. And so then I have found even, you know, to this day, there are people who want you to do things for free in music. And it's, it's pretty ridiculous, you know, but you know, that's just the way it is, mm -hmm. you know? So if you had to uh, enter the business now, in I'd be a lawyer. 23, 24. No. <laughs> would you would you make the same choices would you um maybe keep that bartending um, and wall street job bartending i definitely wouldn't get captain out i would have never done the bartending job <laughs> the wall street job i i don't know but um i think it's a it would be a very hard de decision to make now it was hard to make back then you know when i was you know 20 years old and i was still kind of you know, because if it doesn't work out, it's just, it can be such a huge disappointment, but um, how you make that decision is very difficult. Um, and I think today it's, it's harder than ever. I, I act, I'm not going to name any names, but I do know somebody who's extremely successful that I was spending some time with and working with. And they were just like, I would never do this if I had to get into the business now. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, coming from someone who's that success and I'm talking like you couldn't be any more successful what what are you doing now what is your next project are you still songwriting and and producing yeah I am I'm making a new record right now I am um and it's a rock band but I'm not doing it for anybody but myself really you know and I don't um so yeah if I mean if something good comes from it great but you know I'm really just doing it to, to um, serve my own soul.
So there's a chance that this roller coaster that you've been on is sort of capped out. You've leveled out a little bit. You've got the wisdom. Uh, you to just deal never with know. Potential disappointment. I, no, uh, to be honest with you, I think that most of the things I've ever done in my life, they don't, you know, they don't go anywhere. You know, it's it's always uh, when I say that there's, you know, you keep throwing spaghetti at the wall and some of it sticks, you know, it's just like you keep writing songs and you keep doing projects and then, and some of it works and some of it doesn't, and you don't get to really necessarily control that. Mm -hmm. That's what wow. I think. That's, that's a very good, healthy attitude, but coming from you, I am not surprised. You've been nothing but inspiring in terms of your, your outlook on life and, and how you deal with things. So um... thanks. Thank you, Russ, for um, talking me through this journey that you've been on, which has been really fascinating. And I'm very excited to hear the, the next album come out. Appreciate your time as well. Thank you.